All right. Well, today is Tuesday, October 11th, 2011. My name is Mary Rose, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Eugene B. Redman for an oral history interview. So, Dr. Redman, we here at SIUE feel extremely honored that you've chosen to give your collection to the university. So one thing we'd like to do in these interviews is to describe your relationship with SIUE. So your connection with SIUE started in the very early days of the university. Would you talk about what it was like to be an SIUE student in the early 1960s? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, my relationship began with SIU began in the 1950s. I, uh, in fact, the same year that, that SIU came to, to the Metro East, uh, and to East St. Louis in particular. Uh, I finished high school in 1957 in the January class. Um, the high school in East St. Louis later adopted a policy where there would just be one graduation a year. But for decades, the schools, the high schools, had two graduations, one in January and one in June. So I finished in January. And <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, immediately enrolled um, in classes at SIU E. Now, we didn't say E in those days. We said SIU, and it would be the East St. Louis Center, or the Alton Center, or the Edwardsville Center. There was no SIU E. It was SIU, and then a hyphen, and then the city. Um, <clears throat> the um, classes were located in two buildings, you know, individual buildings. <laughs> One was Morrison School in East St. Louis on 59th Street, also known as King's Highway. Um, and the other, which held the larger number of the classes and was actually the seat of the East St. Louis Center uh, <clears throat> was the old East St. Louis Senior High School which in uh, the late 40s, early 50s moved to outer State Street, built a new um, building or complex. Um, so I would take uh, class is mostly at night because I was uh, I finished high school so I was working. Um, it was quite a time. We we dubbed the East St. Louis Center 10th Street Tech. So you'll see that throughout the, uh, the writing. It even got into places like yearbooks and issues of the Alesto. Um, I was around as the Alesto was coming into being, um, and it um, tickles and troubles me that most of the students wouldn't be able to tell you now, tell you what Alesto is the acronym for. Um, <clears throat> there was a Scottish professor named uh, Murdoch, a very, very uh, deep and uh, uh, resonating Scottish brogue. And he would say, you shouldn't call it the Alestral. You must call it Alestle. It has to be called the Alestle. Otherwise, you leave out Edwardsville. Because Edwardsville got the least number of letters. A-L for Alton, E-S-T-L for East St. Louis, and Edwardsville only got one. Ironically, Edwardsville is the major seat now. At that time, it was not. It was the administrative seat, but it was not the major, it was not the most populous campus. It was East St. Louis and Alton. Edwardsville didn't really have the facilities. Where we're sitting now was where squirrels and possums and raccoons and snakes roamed and prevailed. Um, <clears throat> and there's so many stories to tell about the reaction of the neighbors, the inhabitants of the three cities, 
that's another, I mean, that's a, let's say another whole thing <laughs> just to talk about the reaction, including people in Edwardsville, um, at least one former literally shooting at a helicopter. I don't know if you read the story. It says, yeah, literally shooting at a helicopter um, of people flying over to survey the land and media folks. Yeah. So, so people weren't happy about No, this no, thing? no, some people weren't. Some people weren't happy. Uh, every campus or every site or satellite had its own ambiance, its own history. Um, and the buildings here reflect that, you know. Lovejoy and Alton, you know. Dunham and East St. Louis. The buildings all reflect what was happening around the shirt left college and uh and Alton. <coughs> uh buildings here that belong to people who've been around for um for decades, a century or, or, or more. Um uh, the fact that uh, several governors of Illinois came from Edwardsville. You know, those famous Lincoln Douglas debates. I mean, rich, rich history. We're sitting, some of us were aware or became aware of the fact that this area uh, was like the Washington, Washington D.C. of Indian nations in North America, which is true. This is like the capital of Indian nations in North America. You know, where we sit, I mean, the whole area. I mean, there was just so much going on, and we launched all of these uh, different activities, civil rights, <coughs> excuse me, um, all kinds of marches and protests. I left here going to the wa March on Washington, East St. Louis, in 1963, covered it for the Alestal and a string of uh, Midwestern newspapers. You know. um, there was so much was going on. Anyway, I started out in 1957, and I took classes uh, in both the Morrison School and 10th Street Tech in East St. Louis. And 10th Street Tech, the old East St. Louis I high, Senior High School, was physically attached and in terms of land contiguous, uh, to and in terms of land contiguous with uh, rock junior high school. And that was fascinating because you had a building, you had a college or a university connected to a, a junior high school. And they were still holding classes in the junior high school? Exactly. Oh, I see. Yeah. I was a Saluki patrolman. That's how I earned my keep. You know, I came up from the Marine Corps. I went in a bit too late to get the GI Bill, but Illinois had a scaled down, you know, watered down GI Bill, which gave you tuition. I mean, the only reason I went to college in East St. Louis and Metro East was because, <coughs> excuse me, I couldn't afford to go off anywhere. And uh, also, uh, they said Illinois, the GI Bill had been, um, had ended in 55, I think it did, and so at the end of the Korean War. So I, uh, <clears throat> I took advantage of the, the more simplified GI Bill that Illinois offered, which was, uh, you know, tuition. For being in the Saluki yeah, Patrol. Yeah. So what was the Saluki Patrol? Um, no, uh, tuition to go to school. The mm -hmm. Saluki Patrol. Because SIU was just an appendage of SIUC, we were Salukis. And that's something I always, I always stopped and gave a lecture in every class on the origins, because a lot of students didn't know and don't know. And there were two things I said to them. You have to know how you got here, and you must know who Elijah Lovejoy was. Don't leave this campus and go somewhere and be embarrassed on a job in New York, England, or India, when someone comes up to you and starts telling you about Elijah Lovejoy, and you were here for four or five or six years, and you, and you don't even know who the man is. You know, that's, 
the teacher and me talking, the father talking, the old man talking. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the um, Saluki Patrol uh, was um, a group of young men, all males, who patrolled the parking lots around uh, 10th Street Tech. And to some extent, Morrison, but Morrison's, which was farther east in East St. Louis, you know, we're talking 10th Street, and then we're talking 59th Street, going deeper into East St. Louis. It was still holding elementary school classes. So you could only go there at night. Whereas at 10th Street Tech, which had been vacated by the East St. Louis School District, you could go all day. Um, so that was, that was the physical environment. Now, alongside the, um, uh, on the street, across the street from 10th Street Tech, the SIU uh, academic facility, classroom, and student center, were houses that had some administrative uh, staff and there was a faculty sort of lounge. It's some stately houses running um, north and south on 10th Street and on 9th Street, which both of which bordered or bookended uh, the, the 10th Street Tech and Rock Junior High School. There was also a place called the Beulah House across the street from SIU East St. Louis. And, and that had been a women's residence. Um, and then across the street in another direction, um, <coughs> excuse me, was a, a boys club. A very, very stately brick uh, building. Uh, down the street, uh, a block away, block and a half, depending on where you're talking about, SIU or Rock, was the YWCA, which later became Catherine Dunham Dynamic Museum. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, the houses that used to be occupied by SIUE um, were originally homes and one dental office. In fact, I had I had a town selected me in one of those uh, one of those buildings when I first came home from the Marine Corps. But the three buildings that are now part of the Catherine Dunham complex on 10th Street, you know, her home, her residence, um, her office, and a hostel, they're all still standing. They were private homes. Later turned into one nursing and and then administration buildings. And Ms. Dunham moved in and occupied all three later. And this was like 10 years after SIU started. Life was um, quite, um, quite active. The world, was, the world was on fire with wars, with movements of various kinds. I remember that uh, the phrase feminine mystique. This is now, I, I'm coming back. In 57, I come. Uh, I'm in school for a year, and in early 58, I go to the Marine Corps. I returned to SIU in early 61. I took classes at both Morrison and 10th Street Tech at, uh, in 1957. I remember a class and in, uh, introduction to business, um, toured Granny City Steel, and those are the kinds of things that we did. I suppose, I suppose those kind of things still happen, I don't know, but that was, that was fascinating to see that huge open vat of molten steel and whatever else they were boiling in those, in those cauldrons. Um, <coughs> And I had friends of my uncles and father and 
others who worked, but I had never been there. So it was only thanks to a class that I took at SIU, I finally saw the inside of Granite City Steel. Um, but as I said, the world was inflamed with all of this, this stuff going on. And uh, the, uh, we were, we were that, 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 that phrase, feminine mystique, was thrown around a lot. And uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, um, you know, the, 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 they, they were the emblematic freedom singers. Josh White, these kinds of people who either came through town and we went to hear them, or they came in a campus nearby and we went to hear them. Um, I remember caravans of students leaving to go to participate in civil rights activities in different places, whether it was Cairo or, deep, or the Deep South, you know, whether it was to go to a, a restaurant or a cereal restaurant in Alton or somewhere downtown in East St. Louis where, say, at uh, J.C. Penney's or Kresge's, where black people couldn't eat at the counters. So did and where black women tried on something, you know, some intimate garment, you bought it because the assumption was that no white person would want to try it on. That, that, so we couldn't help. I mean, the places around the university were segregated. And friends of mine, I can call some of the names, Bruce Cook, F. Beasley Lafieu, uh, Carl Sauber, who was a young economics teacher, and he, but, but he hung out with students, a young guy, um, <clears throat> um, Ed Schaefer, who just died, he worked for the uh, AP. Associated Press and uh, was based in the Post Dispatch building for many of me. He's a friend. Taylor Jones was black. The ones I just mentioned were all white. And we would go together. Went to a place called Tony's, which was a bar. And most of the these guys and the women were they were grown like me. You know, I was in the Marine Corps, so when I came home, I was into my twenties, early twenties, right? And my one of my best friends, Bruce Cook. Um, a very wealthy lawyer who lives in Belleville and who won the uh, Similac case, you know, uh, um, and gave his $600,000 um, commission to the Land of Lincoln Legal Aid oh, wow. people in East St. Louis. Because he said to me, Gene, he said, he said they work 40, 50 hours a week and they make 38 $40,000, so, uh, I mean, just saying that's the kind of fulcrum that we came out of. I mean, I mean, I, I, I leapt forward several decades to, to talk about Bruce and, and that, that case, but everybody was really, as we said, on the mark in terms of, you know, very, very conscious. We had several groups of, of players and poets and um, writers. Um, we had the Neo Thalasian Club. Thales was the first, um, first important uh, Greek playwright and philosopher. So we called, we named this our club. Neo Thalasians. And we did all kinds of uh, satirical plays, like, um, and one we, we did um, Julius Seizure, or Mom is the Word. <laughs> and one play we erected a 60 story filter tip top on the riverfront. I mean, we're dealing with that kind of pollution, you know. Um, that was an all-black cast and 
clear for those debts, waiting for lefty, you know, this, you know, plays with statements. Dick Gregory came to the campus. He was an alum. He didn't finish, but he was at Carbondale. And he was big at that time. And he came to the uh, campus. And <clears throat> I remember going in, to the auditorium with three of my professors. And uh, the first thing the professors asked me afterwards was, why were there some jokes that the Negro students, which are better with Negro, there were some jokes that Negro students laughed at and they laughed heartily. The white students laughed, but they didn't quite get it. And then there were some jokes that the white students laughed heartily at the Negro. And I was explaining them the, the, um, the nature of black comedy, that some of it had to do with, say, a strut, for example, or a dip, like a hip walk, and there's something that most of the white students wouldn't have picked up, that two-thirds of that particular joke the hook of that joke was in the way he moved, the way he spun around, you know. And the blacks would have picked it up. And, and, and you know, and that's a, the more cerebral jokes, the white student got, you know. And so you mix, it's a mixture, you know. <laughs> uh, um, that's just an example of some of, some of the kinds of exchanges that we had. Um, intramural, intramural sports. Um, the, um, I was in school uh, and, and, and at school when Kennedy was killed. I remember walking down to the student lounge, which is a basement, and a couple of TVs mounted high on the wall. And one of my classmates, um, beautiful woman, young woman whom I had a crush on, <laughs> he was from Philadelphia or New York. She just fell into my arms and I said, oh, lucky me. <laughs> but she was crying. <laughs> and then, and I said, what? Oh my God, what? And she said, he's dead. And I looked up over her shoulder at the TV mounted in, you know, in the air. And there it was. That very day, you know, that saying, it was, woo, you know. So, um, we, we, you know, every time there was any slacking, which was very rare, you know, in the 60s, any slack up of, of, the, of, of pushes in the movement, there was, there was something else happening, something that would jump start it, you know, uh, like General LeMay saying things like, we're going to bum them into the Stone Age, talking about the Vietnamese, right? Going to Vietnam. You know, it's the general. I mean, we were hard to, oh, no. That, that's, that's a quote. Bum them into the Stone Age. You know, the, <laughs> I mean, you know, we were like, what do you mean? You know, what are you, what are you talking about? I mean, it's just the idea, because a lot of us were, you know, we were, we were studying that. What, you know, civilization, and you know, we we understood what that meant in a way that a lot of other people may not have understood it. You know, uh, may not have picked it up. Um, so we kept, we kept, and then as I said, the feminine mystique. You know, the beat movement. We identified with that. We identified with the folk singers that I mentioned. Um, education teachers said to me. Uh, professors who had taught in other places. Um, they said to me, said it to me then and they said it to me later. And one of them was my mentor who later uh, facilitated my coming, going to California to teach there for almost 15 years. But they all said that they had never had an experience before that or a sense where you 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 were in in the middle of things in media race and and drama. You were in the middle of things. Um, who was I your mean, mentor? You, you mentioned your mentor. Yeah, what, who that was that? Uh, Vernon T. Hard Hornback. Call him Ted Ted Hornback. He used to put. He had a Fiat, the car. He just put books in the car, left it unlocked, 
and he would put books that be up in the window on the back seats. All you did was grab the book and left a note that you had borrowed. <laughs> it was wonderful. And uh, I, uh, as, a, as a Saluki patrolman, I mastered the art of getting into locked cars. These absent-minded professors would arrive on the parking lot, rush in the class. That was, those were the days when you could lock your car from inside. And uh, then, you know, how do you, get, how do you get in? Your key is in the car, car is running. And cars were built a bit more simpler. So I, I had uh, wire, and, but I can open any car. And it happened three or four times a day on any given day, especially if it was cold, snow, Professor ran in. So I would have to open the door, and you know, sometimes I would open the door and bring the keys in. Without the, the professor might not even realize, unless the, unless the car key was on the key to his or her door, office door, then ah, uh, you know, that happened a lot. You know, those days when you could lock your car from inside, uh, it's happened all over the place. So that was one of the things we did. So we just p patrol a lot and. You know, uh, gave tickets if we had to. Sometimes we knew people who were parked. We'd go in and tell them, you know, you got to move your car. You know, we weren't, weren't wanting to give people tickets. Um, so that was the job of the Sluky Patrol, just to kind of, you know, no weapons or anything. We had our um, uniforms. They looked like, uh, you know, looked like bellmen or, or maybe um, uh, security people sort of watered down security people who didn't, you know, have, uh, you know, a ten doorman and <laughs> that's what the uniform looked like. I've actually seen a picture of you in your uniform in okay. the yearbook, so, <laughs> yeah, very official looking. And one, I just want to mention that one of the guys, a Virgil Seymour, who was, each campus had its, uh, had its vice president and its administrators. There was no president because the president was down in Carbondale the highest person that could, you could have in Metro East, Alton Edwards, Bill East, St. Louis, was the VP. Um, and I remember some of those names, but it was a Virgil Seymour who was over the East St. Louis campus. And um, he went in for heart surgery. And at that time, the heart surgery, uh, heart surgery was in, was in its, um, primitive stages. And the interesting thing about it, he made out a will and he wanted me and another black Saluki patrolman to be a be Paul Barrett, along with a US senator, a state senator, a lieutenant governor. It was really eerie. I mean here we are, undergraduates. <clears throat> and he died. And we went to this little town, I'm, I'm trying to Think of the name, little town in Illinois, and that was very, very unusual. We were, we, we were, we, we were. I was a little more together than this guy was because I was ex-marine, and he was sort of like out of, right out of high school. Lawrence Beckham, Larry Beckham, um, and and Seymour's move that that act just told everybody something about where we were as as one of my doctors who's retired now used to say all of the time if we had stayed on that track you know that Kennedy track we wouldn't have them America would be a different place he said but we slipped we tried he's, he's a Haitian doctor and I think you know, I had never thought about it quite like that. You're talking, you're talking 50 years ago, almost. And he said, if we stayed on that track, we'd be okay now. But that man, <clears throat> Larry and I were shocked. Like, 
why? You know, why, why, why? We, we felt it was a curse and a blessing. You know, on the one hand, you know, we got, we, we're with these big wheels, but on the other hand, we got to carry a casket, and we got to, you know, and, and sort of, we're a little uneasy about it. But that just told you what, what that mind, mind, man's mind was, or his consciousness, what he, was, what he wanted to say in a dramatic way as he left here, what he wanted to say in that little Illinois town that we went to, a little town in southern Illinois. He had a statement he wanted to make to the to to his people, to the world. So it was covered, you know, widely, you know, um, because because of the people who were carrying the Pauls, you know, the you know, U.S. An senator, right. or, you know, and right. that kind of thing. So it was going to be get get a lot of attention. So anyway, that's uh, that's one of the things that I think typified that period for the most avant-garde and, and the foot soldiers. You know, people left here and went to different places. Uh, there were lots of um, uh, student editor conferences all over the state, and we would go. We had a fleet of Nash Ramblers, the little cars, eggshell, and um, so we would go to, go to Jacksonville, and we'd go to um, um, well, Lebanon, and all around to Mount Vernon, to various colleges where there were, there it was big, I don't know if that's happening now, but it was really big, and the student editors were mostly radicalized. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a radical time. And to Vietnam, you know, uh, pro-civil, rights, um, um, pro-free speech, um, women's rights. I mean, that, that, was, that was on our tongues every day. That was on our minds every day. And it was in the classes, you know, the, um, the fact that East St. Louis was at least half black, but didn't have one city council person. <clears throat> uh, the teachers were talking, the political scientists were speaking about changing the form of government from city, cal city councilman to alderman, to aldermanic. If you had a city council, it meant you could have all of your city representatives come from one block in the city who was not representative. And they indeed they did. It came from the white neighborhood. If you had aldermanic and you had to have wards, that would guarantee you at least two of the three of the five aldermen and a good shot at the mayorship. So that was they were talked about in in political science classes and sociology classes. The man who wrote the first book on the ride was here. Right, we talked about yeah. him before, yeah. Elliot Rudwick. Elliot Rudwick, yeah. Well, I'm kind of feeling like we should move on and talk about the experiment in higher education for a while and yeah. how you are a teacher counselor there. And But if there's something else you want to talk about um, as your experience as a student before we move on, is there something else um, you want to add? <clears throat> yes, I think that um, in, in connection with the, my collection, <clears throat> I, we took lots of pictures. I became editor of the Illustral after being an assistant editor and associate editor. I was the first Negro editor of the Illustral, and it made national news. Oh, wow. And because SIUE was part of SIUC, then it was like the first Negro editor in 100 years of school. That kind of thing, you know, which is really, so since I was editor, there have been, I think, about 10 here. Because um, I met two or three of them when I was teaching. You know. But I covered the civil rights, my, the, my editorials were aimed at raising the, conscious, the consciousness <clears throat> of the students. And, uh, 
And that was something to me that, that was very special. And I was a little bit older than the teens, because I'd been in the Marine. And the group of people around me, the, my, my special friends, posse, <laughs> um, they, were, they were a little older too. Not everybody, but many of the core group. <clears throat> um, the, the taking of pictures started then. Um, we, we, we had pictures, you know, vivid and illustrative displays. Um, we had, we, still, we began an, a spring arts special supplement where we published reviews of books and art uh, and poetry and excerpts from other kinds of writings with photographs. Um, we, um, I have to found uh, three other newspapers outside. This is all while I was a student, before I actually finished SIUE, and one of them is still operating, the East St. Louis Monitor. Um, <clears throat> I worked on one called the, um, the Evening Voice, and another one called the Beacon, the East St. Louis Beacon. I had some great mentors, too, that maybe we can talk about another time. I had one in particular, a man named W. Nicholas Bowie, who used to smoke pipes, and he called me the professor. Hey, professor. Uh, it was really, really funny. You know? um, that sort of reminded me of a nickname I had in the Marine Corps, which was Dictionary. Because <laughs> I read Dictionary, right? So that was one of my nicknames in the Marine Corps. I read so somewhere I that you first started writing poetry while you were in the Marine Corps. Do I have that right? Well, I guess you can say that, that I got more serious about it. I was writing doo-wop lyrics as a boy, as a young fan. Yeah. There were groups in the neighborhood. You know, my, name, my, my community, and I think most African-American community, in fact, I know in the, in the country, and a lot of non-African, you know, communities across the country, uh, regardless of makeup, had these street corner symphonies. You know, you, you could all, you'd be coming home or going out somewhere and there'd be a bunch of boys on the, on the street lamp or uh, on a front porch or maybe in the alley or maybe uh, under a trestle or under a, a, a roof of some sort and they'd be do 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 working on the harmony. The mainstream called it barbershop quartets, you know, known as doo wops and rhythm and blues. And uh, then you had girls out there who would be trying to sing like the women groups. And uh, so I would write these banal lyrics for some of the people. But yeah, in the Marine Corps, I got going a bit more. It so happened that there were a lot of officers um, who had degrees in English. They were from not from West Point, but from these military academies, like Virginia Military Academy. And here and there you'd find one or two from one of the big, you know, academies, but mostly from, you know, lesser known. And for some reason, I don't know, I was attached to a unit that had helicopters. For some reason, the, a lot of them had degrees in English, you know, and they would read my stuff. My first novel was written in, well, my first and only novel. A superb obituary uh, was written in the Marines. Yeah. So yeah. yeah so. Um. so okay. So and we have the manuscript in the collection of the oh, first really? novel. Yeah. Now you, that was never published, though. No, right? no, no, no. It's a little, just 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 short of two hundred pages. Yeah. Wow, substantial. <laughs> you know. I call it a training novel. What was it about? Uh, it was um, a kind of cloak and dagger and a love story. I was, I was reading, I hadn't been directed, you know, um, until I got in the Marine Corps. I, I had read a novel by Faulkner, but I thought, I 
it was kind of a potballer, you know? I mean, so I didn't realize that Faulkner was as important literarily, <laughs> really, until I got, well, getting out of the Marine Corps, and then when I got to college, you know, because I read a couple of novels that were closer to the stuff that, you know, the Dashiell Hammett and, uh, and um, 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 oh, the man who had the, the detective named Hammer, you know, um, oh. for your time, but. Um, Sam Spade? Who? No. Sam Spade? Yeah, yeah, so Sam Spade novel, yeah, the... Um, Peter Marlowe, no? Yeah, I read him, but, but the one that I really liked um, was... Uh, uh, I, one Lonely Night uh, was the title of one of uh, House on a Hill. I can't think of it right now, but anyway, I was reading, I was reading detective fiction, and now uh, Sherlock Holmes I loved early on, so I was reading his stuff too. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, we should probably continue. So, so after you graduated SIUE, you went to Wash U and got your masters, and right. then then you ended up. Um, becoming a teacher counselor at the Experiment in Higher Education pretty soon after it, it began, right? Yes, what, yes. Why do you think you decided to become a teacher counselor? Well, you know, after I, um, I left Wash U, I became, I had a number of jobs, by the way, and maybe we can go into it later, having to do with writing and then bordered on activism and, and uh, social development, and cultural awareness. <coughs> I'll just sort of run through. Uh, some were simultaneous with my work in journalism, and some came afterwards. I worked one summer for um, the Human Development Corporation, which was the name that, of the St. Louis Anti-Poverty Agency. That was the Great Society that Kennedy and New Frontier, Kennedy and uh, Johnson, you know, projected and, and set up. And um, I wrote eleven million dollars worth of proposals that one summer. Um, uh, so I gained a knowledge of proposal writing then. You know. And just quickly, the, what, what you would do is it would the the program was aimed at creating jobs and um, actually empowering people who normally wouldn't have been empowered. Like, single mothers and uh, um, some retirees and young people and with street academies, neighborhood opportunity centers. And so people would come to me or be sent to me and they'd explain to me what they wanted to do. Like if two barbers wanted to train, say, 10 barbers over, say, eight weeks, train men or three months train young men and women to cut hair. <clears throat> I would then interview them and write the proposal. And the proposal had certain steps, same kind of steps that proposals have today, where you do a theoretical um, um, overlay and then you describe what was gonna happen and you put the equipment and budget. And so, and I knocked that out and then go on to the next one. The next person might say, okay, we're going to uphost the furniture. You know, I got three assistants and I want to train uh, 12 people or eight people to do this. And they explain that business to me carefully. Right? So then, you know, that would happen. And so it went on like that. Maybe somebody was going to do summer program, sports and uh, literacy program for, 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 for girls or boys in the park or on playgrounds. And that's, so I wrote eleven million dollars, which was a real a lot of money then. Eleven million dollars worth of proposal. Um, I also became director of the Head Start or preschool program for Grace Hill Settlement House in St. Louis. That was after I finished um, the, the the summer work, you know, the writing of the proposal, and in part while I was at Wash U, because I finished my courses. Interestingly enough, and one thing I wanted to say about SIUE, 
I was intimidated when I got to Wash U. I remember when I got the scholarship, I was just, I rode over with some friends of mine, rode up Lindo. And we used to go down Lindo. It was like a date, you know, you borrow your uncle's car or somebody's car, and you, you get your girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, and you go down Lindo, and that, that was a date. Looking at those houses, and especially after you cross King's Highway, like, ooh, and each one had a carriage house in the back, you know. So when I got the scholarship, I, I remember driving there with my then girlfriend driving. I did it several times with friends, but straight up to Wash U. And since I was an English major, I knew that Wash U had been founded by T.S. Eliot's grandfather. And I applied to like 33 schools. <clears throat> Later on, I felt so sorry for my teachers because they were all using typewriters. And um, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really uh, take that into consideration. You know, I applied to Princeton, you know, and everywhere. And one of my teachers who had gone to Wash U said, well, actually, he said it, and two other teachers co-signed what he said, that the best school for what you want is right over the river. And I'm thinking, like, oh, I can go way away somewhere, you know. But at the same time, I was sort of grounded here because, you know, I was working and, you know, doing things in the community and so on. So I rode straight out, you know, and you, you know, Lindo ends at Wash U. And... I was like, wow, and then walked around the campus. You know, this was like the the summer before I was going to go there, you know. So, wow, looking at the buildings and thinking. And uh, so so that was, uh, that was a, a high, one of the highlights of my, um, my, my senior year <coughs> and graduation. But anyway, also, I, I directed this Head Start program and I was at that, I was there, um, let's see, before the Head Start program, I worked for the Institute, uh, the, the Sociological Institute at SIU. It was in a house at Edwardsville. Because when I graduated, there were only two buildings on this campus. I think I told you that before. Yeah. It was only the Peck building and I loved your and right? loved your library. Yeah. yeah. So Peck had everything, administration and classrooms and, you know. So I was working here, but it was on the outskirts of the campus in one of the homes. And we were doing a 50-year population projection of the state of Illinois. I was feeding data into computers. The computers were the size of refrigerators. <laughs> The old 1600, 1501, 1600. Did you ever see one of those? Um, <clears throat> so I had that job before I went to uh, Grace Hill Settlement House, which was run by the St. Louis Presbytery, and uh, had uh, seven centers. I asked the man, how, how did I get a job running a, a Head Start program when I have no background working with youngsters? You know or I didn't get the credits needed to even teach in public school. And he said to me, you're a journalist and you know deadlines. So I said, okay. I still didn't quite get it as to why <clears throat> I was hired. So I had that job for about a year and a half. And it was while I was there that I interviewed with the experiment in higher education based at 10th Street Tech and got the job as a teacher counselor. Um, interesting program, exciting, um, daring, uh, originally conceived um, of by three brilliant men, Hyman Frankel, Hyman Frankel um, Dr. Hyman Frankel, a doctor Donald Henderson and a Dr. Edward Crosby. And the idea was to t 
take 40 students who most of whom would not have considered going to college and if they had they might not be admitted and guarantee any school in the world that when we finish with them they'd be ready for a junior year. It might take two years, it might take three, it might even take four. But when they left us, they would be ready for a junior year anywhere. Harvard, Oxford, Spelman, U of I. That was ambitious, you know, that's what we said. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I met Henry Dumas. Uh, Joyce Latner, the great sociologist, who had written a book about the socialization process of black girls, teen girls, uh, based on her research at Pruitt Igo Project, housing project in St. Louis, had been a neighbor of mine while I was at Wash U. So we knew each other already. But I met a number of different exciting people, uh, expatriates, uh, South African expatriates, um, people in exile. Um, it was, there was a cross-section of students and faculty, mostly black students, but not exclusively so. Um, Catherine Dunham's Performing Arts Training Center, which arrived in the same year, actually the Experiment in Higher Education, or EHE, set up shop in 66 and then, you know, started to hire, and, I mean, actually 65, the, the, the negotiations began. And then, you know, shop was set up in 66. Um, the teacher counselor was um, seen as a very unique person. You know, somebody with street smarts and intellectual tools. And each person was picked. The three administrators were like that. They had come out of something called the World Planning Organization, which was based in D.C., consultant firm. And um, so that's what they had. We even had one teacher counselor who was an ex-convict. Um, so that's where we, that's, and, then, and then we assembled these men and women, these mostly young men and women, under 40, uh, and uh, started this daily process where the teacher was a counselor. Every counselor was a teacher. So there was a three-tiered approach, you know, in terms of staff and administrative and administratively. You had a teacher counselor at the very bottom there, working with those students that were counseling those students. Next you had a smaller group called curriculum specialists or designers. These were the people who with the advice and consent of both the teacher counselors and the administrators um, shook up the first two years of courses, shook them up in a, in a cup like dice and redistributed the general education curriculum. You know. What should a student know by the time he or she gets to the junior year and how sh can we make sure these students know that based on where they come from we're gonna and have to so and then and then in the third stage of course was the administrators okay. we're gonna have to take a break here pretty soon but um i just kind of wanted to, f to follow up on something that you just said um about you know making making the courses relevant to the students and I think in, a, in an interview with Sasha Feinstein you said something like it was almost like a, a very early black studies program. Exactly. You know and I think at, around the same time black studies program were just getting started out in California so this is sort right. of a sort of like that. Exactly in fact I, I say that we were we were the first you know there are several that compete it's uh, San Francisco State um, UCLA, USC, you know, that's Southern California, and, and us. Now, we didn't get as much publicity for black studies because we weren't 
avowedly that, but that's what it was, you know. And um, even even the few white students that were in the program lapped it up, you know, because you were getting what you would get in a general education program. But at the same time, ready, readying for a degree, you know, readying for the, the last two years of school, they were getting this all this hip stuff, you know, and all this soul stuff, you know, and the restaurants around, you know, the you know the the soulful restaurants you know, that were around, and working on integrating or making more open and more inclusive the different establishments that uh, ring the ring the university, ring the ring the campus, you know, um, yeah. It certainly was, and that's another that's another um, aspect that can be talked about another time. The curriculum. What did the curriculum look like? What did it sound like? What did it smell like? What did it taste like? What did what was Captain Dunham's role in the, in the curriculum? What was E H E's role in the in P A T C? P A T C was under E H E, and it created some tension. Uh, I remember hearing and overhearing things. And I straddled both. I was a senior consultant to Catherine Dunham, and I was a teacher counselor and later director of language workshops in, um, in EAG. I later poet in residence and director of language workshop after Henry Dumas died. So for the last um, year and a half, that's what I did. You know, that was, you know. Um, I also learned to write a resume, because you know, you really don't, uh, up until perhaps recently, you, you didn't learn to write a resume, and you didn't learn to write a syllabus. You just went through school. You had to do it on your own. One of the things that, that I did after EHE was like consult with people on doing, doing syllabi and resumes. Uh, when I first, uh, Dr. Crosby said to me, write a resume, we want to get you cited for, you know, board of residence, director of, language, director of language workshop. And I said, okay, so I gave him a paragraph, you know, and he said, he interviewed me. I told him, I said, well, I did this stuff in the community, but that was Negro stuff, you know. They don't want to hear about that up here. And he said, put that down. So I came back with like two pages. He interviewed me again and asked me about my life, you know. I said, well, I did this in the Marine Corps, and I used to write and publish in this pub, and this, and that, and I did. put that down. So I came back, I had six pages. He interviewed me again, he pushed me to 11 pages. Oh my goodness. He wanted something very meaty to, you know, to send up to the hill as uh, here, <laughs> and uh, ended up with 11 pages. That just astounded me. Yeah. You know, I mean, the awards that I won over at Wash U and, and writing, you know, I, I didn't think that was, you know, I think you had a degree and, you know, the scholarship, fellowship, I mean, that's it. You know. He wanted yeah, uh, different, di different things that I did the papers and the columns that I wrote and all that. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the more memorable experiences. That yeah, I, <laughs> I guess the next thing we were going to talk about is um, your relationship with Catherine Dunham and how you, how you first met her. Um, there's a lot of materials in your collection about Catherine Dunham, so if you could talk about you know, how you met her and her influence on you. Sure, sure. Let me just back up quickly to the 1940s. I was um, during uh, the period of segregation, you know, we had separate institutions and I would go to, and publications, which some of which we still have, but I would go to the movies and the movies had offered what they call shorts, movie houses, shorts. And, uh, these would be like the little cartoons, but also newsreels of what was happening in the world with an emphasis on black people and the black movies in the black neighborhood. Um, and so I would see Miss Dunham dancing. Um, it would be actual news, you know, reels. Uh, well, naturally, because there were no DVD and all that stuff. <laughs> but. <clears throat> So between the movies, uh, the magazines in the 40s and 50s, um, Ebony Magazine, 
uh, Negro Digest, a magazine called Sepia, one called Bronze Thrills, the black newspapers like uh, the Atlanta World and the uh, Chicago Defender, uh, the uh, Baltimore Afro-American and uh, the Philadelphia paper, which came into the shops and drugstores in, in the black neighborhood. It's a black newspaper. <clears throat> and the radio program. We got everything. We got Cap Calloway. We got Duke Ellington. You know, we got what black troops were doing in the war. Uh, we got, uh, you know, everything, everything. Pearl Bailey. We knew Pearl Bailey was married to a white man, you know. Louis Bells from the drama. I mean, all this stuff came into, you know, to, into our community. So I knew who Catherine Dunham was when she got here. And uh, that was a sense of pride to me, you know, whenever somebody said, who is she? You know, I would say who she was. And, you know, I, I, I was into intellectual pursuits, and I always had a master's degree in English when I met her. So I was, you know, uh, I had a few things going for me. <clears throat> anyway, um, I had, uh, I met Miss Dunham. <coughs> Through her, um, through the Performing Arts Training Center, which she was just organizing. She had come into the state, her state, her native state, to choreograph and stage the Opera Faust at SIUC, 6465. Then she worked her way on a, you know, moved around a bit. And then came as artist in residence to SIUE, which still was not SIUE yet. SIU. Still, uh, it was just becoming SIUE, still, you know, Cougar, Cougars instead of Saluki. <clears throat> so I went to one of the, uh, 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 you know, there, there, were, there were welcoming parties. And I went to a couple of receptions for her. And I went to observe, to watch the drummers and the dancers. And um, I met her. And uh, at the same time, you know, I told her who I was and what I did as a poet. We started talking about T.S. Eliot. She had met T.S. Eliot. She knew a lot about literature. Um, found out that we had been in Japan at the same time. And we didn't see each other. But I'd seen some reference to her in the public, to her in the publication. She was there in 1959, and that's where she wrote uh, uh, *Touch of Innocence*. She wrote her book, uh, the first uh, of a series of biographies, more or less, on up to *Ivan Possessed*. And so <clears throat> we talked about that. One of the more memorable pictures in the museum is of her. Uh, in flight near a huge statue of Buddha. He's a wonderful photograph. Uh, it's almost like she's just flying past the statue, you know. Um, anyway, so that's the background. When Miss Dunham, uh, she asked me, at the same time I met her, and she asked me to become a senior consultant to help her uh, put together proposals that were going to dance forth Rockefeller. Uh, the proposals asked for three to four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and and they were they were they were awarded. They were funded, and they were annually renewable, as I said. Um, <clears throat> so I helped uh, write some of it and put some components in. Um, she has me to be senior consultant. Uh, and I said at the same time, at the same time, I was I was interviewing with with E H E, and being hired. So I started working with Miss Dunham that summer of '67, but didn't go to E H E until the fall, you know, the academic year, uh, when the academic year began. Um, meanwhile, Miss Dunham, uh, several things happened. One was the rebellion that took place 
in July of 67, not only after Miss Dunham got here. Miss Dunham, when she first came to Metro East, she went to Alton and set up a little museum and a home there. And then she, she has roots there, back from her, uh, her um, stepmother. And that she, they came through here, going from Chicago to Alton. They, they came through East St. Louis, and when Miss Dunham was in her teens, so it would have been in 1925. And she talked about a a, um, a Rosa Parks inc type incident, which uh, in, involved the bus driver telling her to go to the back of the bus, and. Her mother was her stepmother saying, Catherine, don't you move. And so it was sort of standoff between the, the bus driver and and Miss Dunham. I, or a bus driver and the mother. You know, so she's doing this, doing that. Um, finally she stayed where she was, but she said it was but it was she she recalls it as a Rosa Parks type incident, but it wasn't time for her to get the kind of exposure that Rosa Parks got, um, what was it, 30 years later, right. yeah. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> she had roots in the area. Um, then I, I began, to, two things happened that affected her life and my life and the life of the community. One was the rebellion called a riot that took place in July, exactly one month to the day that a race riot took place 50 years before that in 1917. And uh, uh, I have some talks built around that and what that might mean, you know, what the racial memory was doing with that. Exactly 50 years later, the month later, the same day, give or take a day or two, that this eruption in the black community. Um, Fifty years after black people were slaughtered, literally, in 1917. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, that happened, and then in the fall, that impacted Ms. Dunham a great deal. And in the fall of 1967, Ms. Dunham uh, witnessed an outpouring of grief, young men and women marching in the street with torches and flashlights after Taylor Jones, the local hero, activist leader, who was chair of the Midwestern region of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, um, and had been my classmate at SIUE. He was killed, he and his wife were killed on their way to Chicago killed in a car accident under what we viewed as suspicious circumstances. <clears throat> so uh, Ms. Dunham mounted a play called The Old uh, Ballet, The Old to Taylor Jones III. And I worked with her on that, and I was in the play. I had a, an important voice in the play and did some narrating uh, also, and I remember lying that Taylor Jones said, when I die, I don't want my brothers to cry. When I go out, oh, death to meet, I want fire and dancing in the streets. And uh, Taylor Jones was never caught in life or after, never bought. All he wanted in that last hour was one final word, black power. And uh, night, a highway in the rain they met. Death was taken by surprise, but not my brother. Let's have no weeping in the streets, he said. And then as Taylor Jones said, when I die, 
I don't want my you brothers to cry. Please return to the circulation desk. When Thank I you. go out, old death to me, I want fire and dancing in the street. And these were dancers from, I'm, um, you know, watering down the, <laughs> this incredible uh, choreographer that Miss Dunham put. You know, I'm saying her words. She wrote the section I just uh, was reciting, the poet. You know. um, <clears throat> So we performed it here uh, <clears throat> in the region, took it on a tour of the East Coast, a tour of the Midwest, the ballet, Ode to Taylor Jones III, 16 high schools in Connecticut alone. We toured uh, up and down the East Coast, New England, the Southeast with that, with that ballet, and some other uh, pieces, some other uh, smaller pieces. Of, um, that had been developed within the Performing Arts Training Center. Um, <clears throat> and the EHE uh, administrators, my bosses, let me go on the road to do it. And some of the EHE people, in fact, they were cross, they were cross listed. I mean, many of the students, I would say half of the students in EHE were also students in the Performing Arts Training Center. Because Ms. Dunham taught in EHE, taught anthropology and dance and some cultural history, and then there was some, there was a, um, a speaking uh, courses or courses in speaking, Wolof uh, from Senegal, Haitian Creole, and French. So on another occasion, we can talk about the curriculum, basket weaving, um, capoeira. Afro-Brazilian martial arts. Um, Would you say that that Catherine Dunham sort of introduced you to, or at least expanded your awareness of like Pan-African type of um, of course, of course, ideas? <clears throat> of course. So we were reading Pan-African texts in EHE. That's something we really have to spend some time talking about. Sometime. But um, we were reading those texts, you know. EHE was the harder intellectual, you know, you know, more um, uh, prescribed course of study, similar to what you get in an, ac in an academy. Miss Dunham, it was it was no no less rigorous, but the emphasis was on performance and culture, the cultural arts. And uh, so you perform, uh, PATC performed what EHE did in classes, except that both did some of each, because we also had plays within EHE um, uh, that that included some of the people from PATC, but they were EHE in origin and design. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I thought it was very fascinating too, some of the approaches that we took, for example, we did one play that we needed a casket, went to the funeral home, got the casket, that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> when I, they delivered a casket and uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, so it was very, um, very community oriented very community directed, very community sprung, very, um, everything was so indigenous as I used to say, you know. And whatever we needed, we would just go out to a restaurant, we would go to um, an office, uh, and we would go to a church, we needed fans, you know, to approximate a choir, whatever. We just went right out because we didn't have any standing things, you know, costumes and all that. So, robes, we'd go to the church, you know, we'd go to the judge's chambers or something, <laughs> get a bench brought over. <laughs> um, I, I remember that very vividly how we went out and solicited those kinds of things and how happy the community was to have, you know, and how it, how it broadened the audience and the things that I learned, I learned about audience development, you know, what you see now, you know, harks back, harking back to that. They, they, my uh, 
my 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 training and development of audiences. You know, um, I also from Ms. Dunham, I, I I I got what I call postgraduate work in one audience development, um, administering cultural programs. Um, I'd already done that proposal writing in '64, but then I learned to write proposals for more money, individual proposals. The proposals I wrote uh, at uh, the um, poverty pro in the, for the poverty program, the Human Development Corporation, they were very few of them were hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I wrote so many, you know, for Miss Dunham. We were writing, you know, like three hundred, four or five hundred thousand dollars. Now we didn't get them all. Some of them were watered down, like the Ford Foundation, and you know, I mean, they they reduced the amount. But uh, I later encouraged, early on and later, encouraged my writers to take courses in dance, take Dunham technique, or study martial arts and voice, because my writers perform in a way that a lot of writers don't. They write well and they perform, and it's something that, uh, that uh, I, got, I brought from Catherine Dunham. The whole idea of if you know your audience, you know your culture, and you bring them something that's similar to what they see in church. You know, you know it's their theater. So it's the people's theater. So if you want to, if you may be reading, some people get down and they do this, uh, uh, but we will often do the Yambalu, which is homage to Dambala, the Haitian deity represented uh, by a snake, by a serpentine movements, and it's like this. The torso, the pelvic. You see the serpentine? And you go all the way down to the floor, as you said. So, and there's several different movements that I learned, and each one correlates to a deity in one of the uh, pantheons of one of the religions that uh, in the third world or the Pan-African world. So you have to know, you know, which Orisha, or which Loa which deity you're going to evoke, you know. I was probably in, well, evoke, invoke, <laughs> you know, you know. And uh, so that's, that's something that, you know, the, the, the cross-fertilization of the poet's work and the dancer's work or the poet's work and the choreographer's work is, uh, is very central to my being, you know, what I became later, I talk about how I was born again in the 60s, you know, and I think so many people from my generation were born again in the 60s, whether it was a, a feminist thrust, a woman's thrust, womanist, Alice Walker, the womanist thrust, whether it was a, a cultural thrust, if it was a, a cross-gender thrust, maybe it was... Uh, activism in gay communities, whatever it was, it, it was cross-fertilized. People had to somehow stage it and have a narrative or narratives. And so all of this you know, worked quite handily as we were recruiting and raising consciousness and uh, um, informing and forming the, the people, you know. Uh, <clears throat> it went along with street academies that were that were cropping up at the time. Even in, like with the Black Panther, there was a breakfast program. There was an education program. There was a uh, there was the protest part of it, but it's called M E and P E. You know, military education. You know how do you self defense and. And P is um, political education, 
Uh, so you have different troops for different elements, for different things, you know. Um, different components, different uh, phases. Um, so those are some of the things that I learned from Ms. Dunham. On a day-to-day -day basis, there were the classes. As I said, basket weaving, languages, <clears throat> African and multicultural uh, thought or philosophy, attitude. There was the um, costume and costume making. When we went hit the road, we traveled with, with uh, people who could sew, people who could, you know, Ms. Dunham was like a lay doctor because she studied with doctors and she could get equipment and she could even give injections, you know, because she would always, she talks about this in her books and talked about it to us, you know, the different thing, uh, ailments that plague people in third world countries, you know, things that would not, that we take a pill that would knock out, you know, they might suffer with for weeks and, you know, sores and the need for salves and bandages and, you know, all kinds of things like that. And, 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 and portable food, you know, compact, uh, containers that kept. So um, and she made sure that those were those kinds of things were available to the troops that moved about, you know. And uh, so I was the manager of the road company, and you know everything from discipline to making sure that uh, everybody was ready to hit that stage, you know. And I would have to go in plowing among those dancers, and they'd be at various stages of uh, being clothed or unclothed. And sometimes they'd laugh at me because I may be the only male in there. You know, but, you know, if they were going to they were gonna put on corsets for a can, can I mean, we needed some help, you know. <laughs> you know, they, they might be sweating, you know, in, in that dressing room or backstage, they might be sweating with you know, and with their birthday suits on, as we say. And you, your thing was to get them zipped up. Because, you know, you had like three minutes. Somebody said two minutes. Somebody said 45 seconds. Oh, gosh, she doesn't have it, you know. So, you know, back out for the next number or, or for the, your segment of that larger ballet. So it was, um, it was exciting. I mean, it's, exciting. you know, there's so many anecdotes you talk about that. I mean, the drummer's getting used to coming on stage with no shoes, um, that's the way it was. You didn't go out there with shoes on. Uh, we had one dancer who liked to wear, you know, she was um, very beautiful. And she's in her 60s now. And we joke about it. She wanted to wear these huge rings, you know. She was always getting these gifts from men. <laughs> and she was just a, a real fancy lady, you know. So... She had these diamonds, and I said, look, the dance is Molly circa 1400. You can't wear that diamond ring. I ain't, I ain't taking my ring off then some, somebody, for somebody to steal. You know, I said, no, you can't do it. You can't go out there in that ring. This is a period. I mean, Ms. Dunham, this research has been done. Uh, and she always said, a, a fur coat sweeping the floor. I mean, she was just an uh, interesting lady, but we, we would just have to say, you can't wear that necklace in a dance that's, that takes place in medieval Africa. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't wear a tiara that, that came from Tiffany's, you know. <laughs> so I'm just thinking of the different kind of things, including that uh, the three days that we were stranded at the airport, I think I mentioned that. Yeah, for three days, two and a half, three days, we were stranded outside of Kennedy Airport. We were only about 100 yards from the actual airport, but, but snow was up to the window of the bus that the troop was riding in, right? Ms. Dunham had gone ahead ahead on a plane, you know, so she wasn't on the bus. I was manager of the road company. We had two kids that would, we were tutoring, they would go on the road, they had a little act, two boys. They slept up in the... Uh, baggage compartments, you know, if they're not, you know, on the buses in those days, they weren't like, uh, they, the whole rack was open, so they would just put them up there like they were in a hammock, you know, and uh, <coughs> um, the Beatles 
and um, who was it? The Beatles and Diana Ross and the Supremes were in the airport. So they gave impromptu performances. 1968, uh, cars all around us covered with snow. Some people died. Snow up to the uh, window of the bus. We reached out. When our water ran out, ran out, our bottle of water ran out, we reached outside the bus window and grabbed snow for, to hydrate ourselves, right? Because you could, and then we, we had had a bunch of Hershey bars and, and bags of peanuts and um, chips of various kinds, so, and Twinkies and stuff. We had a bunch of that stuff, so we were able to survive for a day or so. And then I sent a search party out, and, you know, gave them a little lesson in, uh, in how to read where the sun was and, and directions, like from Marine Corps days, using the compass, right? And so I talked to them, and he took, sent two or three strapping young male dancers up to the uh, airport. I mean, they just waded through snow, like you wade through water, right? And they came back. Most stuff was so lucky. People in the airport, they were buying everything, everything in the vending machines, everything in the, you know, in the in the, um, in the cafeterias and the snack bars and the and the bars. People were drinking, you know, <laughs> they were drink ourselves, you know, uh, into oblivion because we 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 hold up here in this, this snowbound airport. So they came back with backpacks with some some stuff. And uh, uh, it was a it was a it was a, a a a unique experience to say the least. And I see people today who were there, and they say '68, Kennedy Airport. You know what they're talking. They don't even have to say anything else. 1968, Kennedy Airport meant they were on that bus, stranded, and as I said, while some people around us were dying, you know. And the cars like Volkswagens, uh, which was popular in the late '60s, you know, they're coming back now, but. Cars like Volkswagen and Laura, I mean, most of the cars were covered because if, if the snow was up to the window of the bus, you know, that's higher than most automobiles you right. know, to go. So that was, one, that was one of our experiences. We performed for Coretta Scott King shortly after uh, Martin Luther King was killed. And uh, <clears throat> um, so, so, so those are some of the things that the that the PATC did and Ms. Dunham did. Um, the, actually, something that you mentioned made me think of something. Um, your book, the uh, um, Drum Voices about the African American poetry for over 200 years, and then Drum Voices Review. The word Drum Voices was that something that uh, you started to think about knowing Catherine Dunham. That's right. The that's idea right. about Drum Voices. Had I not met Ms. Dunham, I probably would not have used the word. Uh, <clears throat> because I'd come out of a fairly rigorous study in modernism, cla classical and modernism um, in literature, you know, at Wash U. <clears throat> and Wash, Wash U was a, a stiff experience. You know, it had its merits, but uh, it, was, it was at a time when the world was on fire. And I was said to one of my uh, advisors, um, I'm, tired of, I'm tired of reading dead white poets, you know. It was, it was something happening out here, I said to him, you know, blowing up. In fact, I have a little poem that said, in the 60s, we stopped reading dead white poets and started reading dead black poets. And, I, and the little poem goes, the difference was that the dead black poets were still alive, meaning that what they were saying, you know, that, all that talk about lynching and the struggle, you know, the, the, the kinds of topics, the kinds of um, images and allusions and references that they, they were using were still with us. I mean, the issues were still with us. And that's what is meant by saying, well, the dead black poets were still alive. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to get out here and see what's going on. And um, um, so, yeah, we... Um, we were, we were really uh, in the whirlwind, as, as some of our uh, colleagues would say. 
and were saying. We were in the whirlwind at that time. Um, <clears throat> so yet the the uh, Miss Dunham took <coughs> what we what was happening in the street. Like one of her plays is called The Lesson. Um, it, the lesson was actors talking about and kids talking about learning to do the, the, the work that needed to be done to free people, to advance the movement, to advance the struggle, to continue the struggle. And so that was, you know, part of the, the lesson. That's what the lesson was about, a little play called, play let called The Lesson. Um, <clears throat> the, there were so many things going on. Ms. Dunham picked up a lot from us, too. She brought a sophistication. I thought that was very interesting. I mean, East St. Louis had a tradition of some sophisticated people. Some people went off to Juilliard, people who went off to U of I, people who went off to the little black colleges, the HBCU, people who had uh, <clears throat> performed in, in plays and, um, and uh, movies, showboat, Barbara Antera, Miles Davis, Eugene Haynes. Um, a man named John Hicks had worked for the United States Information Agency, later becoming deputy director, uh, associate director. Reginald Petty was uh, deputy director of the Peace Corps, spent 14 years in Africa. You know, I had my, you know, I'd been going to watch you. And had people doing, I mean, we had people doing some of everything. But as far as the rank and file people, Ms. Dunham brought a kind of sophistication you know, intellectual urbanity, you know, um, you know, the way she talked, which blended all the different languages that she spoke and all the places she had been, you know, and so you listen, like, you know, where is she from, the language she's using. Um, she brought uh, Miss Aluba, <clears throat> a, 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 a dance ballet. She brought psychedelia, a dance ballet. She created a, a, a whole ballet play around a local hero. I mean, he was a local hero, but then Catherine Dunham enshrines him in a stage play and takes her across the country and the world. And we're saying, oh, wow, he's ours and she's doing this. Uh, whenever there was a, an op uh, uh, the opening or the um, installation of some new business, you know, fast food, the fast food industry was coming. So there are two or three that opened while Ms. Dunham, you know, not long after Ms. Dunham got here. She would bring a dancer, she would um, expunge the, um, the, um, the evil spirits or call up the native spirits, you know, lighting some, some powder or a candle and uh, have the drummer, you know, uh, uh, do uh, do something to bless the place. People have never seen that before. You know, here's uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken opening, and right there in the in the in the area where people sit and eat or order, Miss Dunham has these drummers and these dancers in the native costumes. She might have two Native Americans and three or four young black girls and and a, and a four four drummers and a still one come in and they consecrate the place, right? It happened frequently um, when the Old Man River uh, establishment opened. Why Veda Young, uh, with the collaboration between Why Veda Young and R. Buckminster Fuller. You know, she had uh, the drummers come out, she had uh, the service, the, 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 the king's drummer or the Oba's drummer or the chief's drummer come out and bless the place and uh, expose the, um, uh, you know, any, any evil spirits, you know, and call in the good spirits from the Native American culture, the African culture, and our slave uh, ancestors, you know. And all that was taking place across, I mean, you couldn't walk more than three or four blocks in East St. Louis at that time and not hear some drums coming out of a window, off of a balcony, from a porch, from a rooftop, from a basement, you know, 
and Africans walking around and Indians walking around in the neighborhood, living in the neighborhood. I mean, you saw some as missionaries and here and there, but nothing like that, where you had a whole company of people come in and live in the community, get, get put up in houses. I mean, that just transformed the city. What we've been used to in my generation of youth was hearing the flight of the bumblebee come out, you know, of a window, or seeing young ladies uh, tip off to um, uh, take their, their ballet lessons. It's like, uh, you see them with their shoes, you know, with the tips, and their, their, little, their, little, their little skirts, and they'd be going off, walking down the street, uh, to get a bus or to meet uh, whoever's going to pick them up, to go to downtown to take ballet from a German or someone upstairs over the bank in one of those studios. It would just, just disappear into that white world and come back, and you, you see them twirling on, a, you know, on occasion in the yard or on the porch. You know, and that was the culture. You know, the other culture, our real culture, the blues and jazz and rhythm and blues, uh, that you could dance by or sing to, we took that for granted. It was during that period that we started saying black instead of Negro. So you think and so, Catherine Dunham helped people feel more uh, proud of their own culture or realize the value of, of their course, own culture? Of course, of course, you know. I mean, when I, when, I, when I say, we used to beat on boxes and oatmeal boxes and tubs, but when you, when you go, when, when, when you get to a point where, as I said, you can't walk too far in any direction without hearing some drums, and these are authentic African drums, or facsimile thereof, then you know that this, has, this movement has penetrated, has pervaded the culture. You know? And people coming with names like More Charm, you know, and um, um, Rene Calvin from Haiti, and you know, you had to get to know these names, you know. Um, uh, uh, Louis, Rachel Louis from Haiti. I mean, there were names that we didn't, uh, people didn't use before. They didn't pronounce them before, you know. And Misa Luba and uh, Shaka Lulu, the names of dancers and so on, you know. A woman with cigar, even like <laughs> one of Dunham's pieces of choreography, right? So you had these people coming from all these cultures. You had them wearing what they wore at home. You had them speaking. I was assigned to more charm. He didn't have one word of English when he got here in 68. You know, he'd be somewhere and he would call me. He knew how to call me, but he didn't know how to tell me to come and pick him up. So I would tell him to go outside and draw what he saw in the street sign and bring it back in to the phone. Right? He would end up somewhere, he'd be in Brooklyn, Illinois, so he'd end up somewhere, and people would have gone to work. He'd stayed overnight at some people's homes, you know, and he would have gone to work. They would have gone to work or whatever. So I instructed him what to do. And he would go outside, and he would draw the letters that were on the street sign, come back in, and he had begun to learn to say some of the letters. He described to me what... Uh, what the letters look like. Line, line, line. And then I said, oh, you're in Brooklyn, Illinois, and you're on Alpine Street, so I'll be there in about 10, 15 minutes, you know. It was, you know, it was just little things like that, you know. <laughs> and that's how, that's how on several occasions I was able to go and collect him, you know. Um, so you have all this. These are people, Dunham's people, you know. These are people that Dunham brought here. You know, and uh, there was a woman named Nardal, the Indian, who was a dramatist, and she did plays. Miss Dunham made it a point of mixing the cultures. You know, we had um, uh, a French dancer, a dancer who would choreographed one of my pieces with Dunham's assistant and supervision. She choreographed a poem of mine. Um, and um, there was um, dancers came from Brazil. Uh, our chief teacher of capoeira, the Afro-Brazilian martial arts, was a, man, was, a, was a doctor from Brazil. So, <clears throat> okay, now EHE complimented that because some of the teachers were from uh, South Africa and other parts of Africa. 
and some from, came from other countries. And there were European Americans along with black Americans. So uh, <clears throat> it was a time like no other time in the city. There was just no other, no other time in, in memory. It was, it, well, there had never been a time, uh, uh, unless you go back to the original days when there were Native Americans and then the French Jesuits who came, the people who came down from the north to St. Lawrence and down from Chicago, and the, and the people, the French people who came from Louisiana, and the settlers who came in from Ellis Island, you know, the Indian fighters like James Piggott, uh, which is one of the names East St. Louis used to be called by, Piggott, and we, there was a Piggott's Landing on the riverfront, and all these people, John Robinson, a black man who had fought with the Union in the Civil War and witnessed the execution of John Brown, uh, you know, at Harper's Ferry. And, you know, that was early St. Louis. You know, Native Americans were visible and moving about. And then, of course, you know, you get the flight of the whites and then you get the kind of uh, um, East St. Louis that Dunham helped, helped to a jump start a trigger and and start an, and 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 come to us anew, you know. I kind of um, as you're talking about this, I know that you've um, spoken of yourself as a son of Catherine Dunham, mm -hmm. um, and I think about how you've brought so many people to the East St. Louis area, um, just various writers from across the country. You know, looking through the photos that you've taken, you know, of all the different people that you've brought here, and you've brought. Some people, I think, um, some East St. Louis people to other places, like some um, some of the people with the Writers Club. You know that you know you've traveled with them. You know to so I I guess I I'm seeing that in a way you're sort of carrying on Catherine Dunham's legacy in terms of bringing the world to East St. Louis and bringing East St. Louis to the world. That you're you sort of have followed in her footsteps in that way. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <clears throat> and um, I, um, I, it's funny because Ms. Dunham kept telling me to leave and see the world. I've seen the world. And then right after I left, she called me and said, what is your commitment to East St. Louis? She would call me like every other day, and I said, it, it's strong and it's deep. Well, when are you coming back? She was the one who said, leave. You know, get out. I've seen the world. I've done everything. Now you get out. You don't want to get stuck here. And so I took off and went to Oberlin for a year as writer in residence, and I went on to California. But Ms. Dunham would call me every few days and ask me, when are you coming back? <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. Well, I said, you know, you're the person who told me to leave. I know it, but, you know. So, um, and, sh and, and the same thing that she did is something I'm doing. Like Ms. Dunham was always going somewhere, and I'm always going somewhere. I always say, you know, to people, you know, I can I can stay you know, here and I can stay other places too, but I need a pair of skates, I need a sled, I need a helicopter, a bus, a car, a train, a van, a tank, a trump, you know, it's got because I need to move, you know, and then come back. So you gotta give me some way to get to other places. I'll be back, but I've got to go too. You know? And that's, that's the way I've always been. Ms. Dunham was like that too. She took us to see Eric Fromm. I think I mentioned that. And we spent three days with Eric Fromm. He was the reigning psychiatrist at the time, the successor to Freud, you know, in some people's mind. They talk about mob violence and movements and history, and, you know, psych psychology of, of groups and how a group can be, you know, a peaceful group can be turned into a mob by agent provocateurs and, and people who jump, who jump the gun, you know. Um, so that, that was good. I mean, I helped recruit, there, and there were a lot of wonderful people who were working with Ms. Dunham, you know, like Daryl Braddix, whom she, whose assistant she went to when he was jailed in 1967 doing, you know, his interaction with some other black power rights on the corner in East St. Louis. There's Ruby Street, the dancer. 
Yeah, Fayo Jameson, who directs the East St. Louis uh, Performing Arts Program. I mean, on and on and on. Her, her confidant and assistant who died uh, five or six years ago, Janelle Stovall. Uh, there's a man named Robert Lee who filmed everything. He videotaped, we used to say in those days, videotape. Videotaped everything and recorded everything. And on and on and on, there's so many people that were helping, you know, that served as bodyguards. I always, I refer to myself as Miss Guard, Miss Dunham's bodyguard, confidant, chauffeur, translator. <laughs> you know, because she would ask, like, what are they saying? I mean, she'd hear what sometimes referred to as, as, as ebonics, ebonics, you know. She'd hear black people talking and she said, translate for me, you know. She had kids talking, you know. And I'd tell her what, what was happening. It would be speedy, speedy, you know, give and take. And if you don't know it, I mean, it's so fast. You know. Here go. And that means uh, I'm going to tell you something or something is about to ha happen. But here go. You know? <laughs> well, we're about out of time. Um, was there any last thoughts you want to, you know, leave us with regarding anything that we've talked about today? Or? Uh, that uh, learning experience that um, there were a lot of people involved who left us some wonderful things to think about and some challenges who are dead now. Um, a lot of the people helped welcome Miss Dunham, um, Robert Young, Lila Teer, Lena Weathers, who is not dead, but she gave a reception for Miss Dunham at her home when Miss Dunham came in from Senegal, where she had been, and um, she had been an attache to the president of Senegal at the um, um, First World Festival of, of African or Negro Arts in '66. Um, Miss Dunham, there, there are people that um, that gave their lives literally for her. She did not know it um, and wasn't supposed to know it. We used to drive through by her house all day and all night, you know, just to look, make sure she, there were threats, you know, death threats to her and some other people because she was doing something new. Um, and the threats came from various uh, sources. You know, they thought, some people thought, like, like in ancient, <laughs> like in Athens when they thought that Aristotle and Plato were poisoning in the minds of the youth. Well, some people thought Miss Dunham with that voodoo. Her nickname is the Black Witch on 10th Street. There's a chapter in one book about her that's called the Black Witch of 10th Street. Uh, Miss Dunham performed an incredible, almost unimaginable um, chore or job. She came into East St. Louis <clears throat> worked with all of East St. Louis, but the black community primarily. If you are going to move a black community, you cannot not be in a sorority like she was. You cannot not be in a sorority. This is how black communities operate. You cannot not being be married to a white man, <laughs> you cannot not be um, a teacher. You, in other words, she came into a city that says, "Okay, the first thing you got an education. What do you what do you do? Do you teach?" Or you're a nurse, I see. you know. Right. Or you're in undertaking business, you know. At that time, 
What are you doing? Anthropology? Or you, what, what Christian church do you belong to? Voodoo. Now just, just think about the incredible work that this woman did. You can't do it. Now, what does your husband do? Oh, he's white and he's a designer. Not that people run you out. I'm just saying, you know, what do you, to run a, to run a black community, if you're educated, which sorority fraternity are you in? What, what your, where's your degree from? And what did you major in? What does your husband do? What does your black husband do? <laughs> what Christian, Christian church do you belong to? And I could go on. I used to have a lecture on just that, 10 things. And people, you could see those people out there bowing and, and some shaking their head like they do in church, like women can't believe it. Like, how do you, how could she go there and turn up? You get run out. If it had been Detroit, she'd been run out of town. You know, people just kind of, you know, speaking, um, what do you call it? What's the word? Um, hypothetically. You don't do that. You don't go into the gut of a black community. You're not a Christian. You're not a Sarah. You're not um, a, um, a school teacher <laughs> or a nurse or, you know, about four things. Uh, <laughs> She's You're not married to a black man. <laughs> you know, you, and you go into the community and organize. I mean, you, you, right. want, you, you want those children. So you have to get native sons and daughters. You have to pick some people that the people trust, that the people know, knew like that. You know, so you get a representative wife at a young who's not a representative yet. She becomes a state representative, right? But at the time, she's a practicing lawyer and she works for the anti-poverty program, you know? So. And uh, you get these people, intellectuals who understand, and even basic people, like Daryl Braddock's mother, who didn't have all those credentials. And they say, this is good. But still, you've got to win them over, you know? I mean, it is, it doesn't happen. And you come right up the center of that community and sit like Buddha, commanding all that respect. Voodoo queen? Not in the Bible Belt. <laughs> <laughs> you get my point? I mean, that's just, some, that's an aspect that's overlooked. I mean, because people, the right people just haven't looked at it. You know, it's, a lot of books have been written, a lot of articles have been written, but you have to understand it from the ground up. The, you have to understand her achievement in the black community. Because the, the people, the first woman superintendent of schools, for example, is a Delta. She's a AME, coming down to Lillian Park. She you know, was a teacher before she was superintendent. She's a Delta. Married to a man, you know, a coach and a teacher, black, you know, and you go on and on and on. All the things that you were supposed to do. And she's powerful, maybe the most powerful woman in, in the city. But she has all those right credentials. The same thing with Dr. Lena Weathers, you've seen her. Same thing with uh, Yvetta. Yvetta is an AKA. She's a lawyer, married to a, a lawyer. That's what she was. She died, you know, on up the line. Here's somebody that runs right through the center of it with none of those things. She still got it done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just that in itself needs to be needs to <clears throat> um, have a book written about it. Just that point, you know, looking at the community and looking at her feet, you know. Um, the Black Witch of 10th Street. <laughs> Remarkable woman. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good note to end on for today. Yeah. I know. I know.